Good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Sounds like one of those TV shows, doesn't it? <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, this is a very interesting evening this evening because um, it takes place while Europe is involved in a pretty serious and worrying um, situation uh, with uh, Russia having taken over Crimea, Crimea in the last um, 48 hours and concerns about uh, the future of Ukraine which um, as to whether it's going to move into the European Union some people want it in, some people don't. Um, Vladimir Putin certainly doesn't want it in there. Um, and what's going to happen in Crimea, and also a number of other issues too, uh, including the upper house in Britain, the House of Lords. Now, if you've been following um, ABC News over the last 24 hours, you'll hear some severe criticisms of the Australian Senate. Now, the Australian Senate is elected, but um, there's been really irritated criticism about its effectiveness. And I suppose one of the questions I would ask, when did it, has it had any kind of debate about Ukraine? I don't see it. Has it had a serious debate recently about Syria? I don't remember it. So um, before we criticize the unelected House of Lords, which has actually well over 700 people in it, many of whom are from rich and varied professions, along with a couple who serve time in jail. Uh, but that's life, isn't it? That's a microscosm of British society. Um, we, we perhaps should um, examine uh, the House of Lords um, a little more um, forensically, I would say. Anyway, uh, it's my pleasure tonight to uh, have here with us the Earl of Sandwich, the 11th Earl of Sandwich. I'm sure he'll tell you about the first Earl of Sandwich, uh, but he is the 11th Earl of Sandwich. He's a hereditary peer in, in the House of Lords. He's an active member of foreign affairs committees, including those involved in development and in the European Union, amongst many others, and uh, is very well informed on international policy, not just of Britain, but that of the European Union. And he's here with his wife, um, here. We're delighted to welcome you here, um, Lady Sandwich. Thank you. Your first visit to Australia, I understand. Um, I hope you've got over your jet lag. We're delighted that you've agreed to um, spend some time with us this evening. And so, without me carrying on any longer, I present to you the 11th Earl of Sandwich, John. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Thank you all for turning out, I was going to say, on a warm evening, but you're always having warm evenings here. Um, my wife was invited to the Middle East, well, to the Arab-Australia Forum to speak at a conference. And she is the reason that I am here. But very kindly, uh, our friend Cynthia, who's also here, uh, who's organizing the conference, contacted Colin, so has given me this opportunity. Can you hear me all right at the back? All right. Um, we envy you in Australia. We've been looking at wonderful coloured birds and flowers in the botanical gardens, and you've got this wonderful weather, and you've got this very fine cricket team, <laughs> which we envy. And I was putting postage stamps on my on sort of postcards home, and I suddenly realised. We're sending home pictures of Captain Clark and the whole team, just to remind everyone if they had forgotten. So um, we'll get over that. Um, but it is our first visit to Australia, and we're delighted to be here. And it, it'll be a personal tour d'horizon, this and not an academic talk, I, I can guarantee that. But I hope we haven't got so many subjects that we'll all fall down exhausted. And I, I must keep my watch close. Um, I must introduce myself 
uh, again, as Colin already has, as a member of a vanishing species, which is the hereditary peer in the House of Lords. We don't know how long we're going to be around. Uh, this is an honour which has been achieved by means of an outdated system. We know it's anachronistic, but it's nonetheless it's still legitimate, the hereditary system. And I was chosen in 1999 as a crossbench or independent peer by my fellow peers, because we had to choose among the hereditary peers how many to preserve. And we got the figure of 92. And there were nearly a thousand of us, but most of us didn't come in at all, so we weren't seen. But the ones who were seen, of course, got, got elected. So we're not so many different than we were in, in the original House of Lords when I first came there in 1995. So um, I ought to start with a potted pedigree. Uh, because none of us pretends to be truly independent. We've all got our prejudices and our backgrounds to reckon with. I'm, I'm a political hybrid because my mother was a liberal, my father was a quite extreme conservative, anti-European, pro-empire or commonwealth. And he even became chairman of the Anti-Common Market League. And he was an East of Suez Tory. I don't know whether they, they still exist anywhere in Australia. Um, <coughs> who would have happily carried on with the Commonwealth and disregarded the Europe, floated it off or somewhere else. Uh, but I inclined to my mother's left-leaning position. Uh, but I do understand the arguments on, on the right as well. So I, I'm, I think uh, crossbench is one word for it, but I can think of worse terms to describe this, such as fence-sitting and so forth. I will now flash back to my ancestor and the namesake, who was John Montague, the fourth Earl of Sandwich, who was born in 1718 and credited with eating the very first sandwich, if we believe that. Um, and this household name, which is now evident in every town in the whole world is in fact based on the port of Sandwich as I'm sure you all know. The first Earl of Sandwich was uh, given the title Earl um, because of his services in the transition from Cromwell to Charles II. But he was actually a Cromwellian who had changed his colours as many people did in that, that time because the army was in charge and the there was virtual anarchy in, in the late, 19, uh, late 1660s, 1650s. And he, in his political career, he was three times for, f First Lord of the Admiralty. And in that job, he managed to lose America. But we say in the family, he, he won Australia and New Zealand as a sort of compensation. Uh, to make up for the carelessness of, of uh, losing them. And this is a reference to his sponsorship of Captain Cook's second voyage in the resolution. Um, and of course he presided over the publication of the journals of Cook, which was one of the struggles of that time when Cook came back with Sir Landon Banks and all that material. They had to be politically controlled in the sense that you had to think carefully how you were going to publicize the information acquired. So that's my Oz connection. And we went yesterday to the marvelous replica of the Endeavour in, in the dock uh, in Dar Darling Harbour, isn't it? So he spent his life in the Navy, presiding over the Navy and outwitting the French mainly, rather successfully which is forgotten in the American War. You had to deal with the French first. Um, and I think he would have voted against Europe in a referendum <laughs> as well, just like my father. And he probably voted against Scotland being in England, uh, having fought against Bonnie Prince Charlie in 1745 because he was a close 
friend and supporter of King George III and explained to King George when he inherited what the Navy was all about and he took him around the dockyards and the, the whole dockyards area in Portsmouth was transformed uh, uh, in his administration. Well now this raises the referendums thing. Uh, what is it about referendums that we are so keen on them? Why do we talk about referendums at all? And I mean, I'm all for accountability and national integrity, but I'm not in favour of using referendums halfway through a parliament, unless the issue is of real constitutional importance. And I don't think there is, talking of the EU first, I don't think there's enough to justify an EU referendum. It's something the Prime Minister has, has used. The Prime Minister David Cameron is, is like the majority of Conservatives, keen to stay in the European Union. One forgets that at the moment because of its obvious economic and other advantages. But he's worried about his own position in the party if he doesn't take a stronger line. And politically, I think he's pushing the boat, boat out too far. And he could easily lose the next election as a result. So. You, you'll remember that he's made this promise that he will put the referendum in his election manifesto, that it shall take place before uh, 2017, but I don't think it'll actually take place myself. Of course, he's trying to sort out the problem of his right wing defecting to UKIP, the Independence Party, which is undoubtedly growing in number, and we understand that. But I, I also see the need to revise our position within the European Union. You don't need a referendum for that. You don't even need a change of treaty. And so we must re-examine what are called the competences of the European Commission. And there's no doubt that they do need reviewing. Which means how far should we tow the line on external borders, for instance, or foreign policy? but above all, monetary union. Um, obviously, monetary union has divided the members quite radically. But, but Cameron knows he must not push it as far as a new treaty, because that will certainly trigger referendums all around Europe. And you remember, there were some catastrophic referendums in France and in Ireland. Um, so no one wants that. One area of revision should be in the role of national parliaments. And this was mentioned in the Lisbon Treaty. But it was overshadowed by the new powers given to the European Parliament. But in fact, it should be both. It should be the European Parliament and more powers to the national parliaments. Another is, of course, immigration, which is a big concern of every country now. We're already outside the Schengen Agreement, which makes the rules on immigration in Europe. But I personally would like the UK to take a more proactive role in harmonising policy on refugees and migration. And then on law and order, we've been like bad children throwing toys out of the pram. We've opted out of no less than 130 measures in law and order from Europe. Take one of them, the European arrest warrant. We must have the European arrest warrant. You know, we must know when people cross borders and how we can catch up with them. Um, so the absurdity is that we've thrown these toys out of the pram only to be getting, picking them up and putting them back in again. This is all for UKIP, uh, the Independence Party. And I think this, our government in the UK has tested the patience of European leaders like Chancellor Merkel and Monsieur Hollande. But everyone remembers Mrs Thatcher and the rebate, so we don't want to give that up. That's the one thing we do keep. And I am, incidentally, an enthusiastic European, but I hope I'm somebody with his eyes open. I recognize the UK has an island mentality and a strong sense of independence. But most of us, and this is where I join with most Australians and uh, Americans, 
are originally Europeans. We are all, after all, descended from Saxons and Vikings and Normans and others, and we fought for and across Europe during two world wars. We have to keep remembering how recently Europeans were tearing themselves apart, like parts of Africa and Asia today. So we look back to the war now because of these anniversaries. And we're not just the, um, if you think of the spirit of Winston Churchill, we're not just the sceptered isle. It, we mean, it, that means, the spirit of Churchill means something beyond the White Cliffs. Um, it means, as he said famously in, in Zurich, that we are part of a united Europe. And our destiny lies there. Mrs. Merkel has reaffirmed this when she came to Parliament last week. Um, the word united means working together and no more than that. Nobody wants a federal state these days. Europe is our major trading partner. We, it receives over 40% of our exports. We're benefiting in many ways from it as a single market, even though we don't want to join the currency union. We're about to enter an important trade treaty with the United States, known as TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade Treaty. I'm sure you will know a lot about this treaty. Um, I'm cautiously in favor of it, and I hope it becomes a model for other international trade agreements. If it works, it promises to bring tariffs down. It promises to remove regulatory barriers. The US, for example, think, thinking of tariffs, is still charging 30 to 40 percent on footwear from Europe, for instance, and uh, similar tariffs on clothing and textiles. There are many obstacles in this treaty. It may never happen, but if it, even if it takes three years, it, it's, worth, it's worth having. The ISDS, which is a very complicated me me mechanism, the Investor State Dispute Settlement, it's called. This is highly contested by the unions. It's a, it's, it's a means of arbitrating if you have a dispute in, in investment. And they are, all the unions are very worried about the loss of sovereignty, for example, in procuring health services. They might take over, other countries might take over our national health service. And I, I expect you, you have similar examples in public services where we are worried about other countries intervening in our sovereignty. Financial services are still subject to far too many regulations. And these could be made more coherent on both sides. Europe is hesitant about GM products and processed meats, hormone-free beef and so on. But there are signs that Brussels may here may compromise. Now, turning to the political side, um, and I'll move on from, from the EU in a moment, but I, I personally would like to see Europe expanding rather than being a rule-based smaller Europe. I would rather we stretch the rules a little and we expand. And I think that's a controversial view. Um, we know that the rules are too rigorous. We're always joking about crooked cucumbers and straight bananas. But we're now 28 members. We've got to be very clear about what the rules are going to be. We have something called the Copenhagen Principles of Democracy, which we try and apply. And this means we're trying to forge a democratic, accountable Europe, subject to the rule of law. And this must be our ambition. I freely admit this has proved quite difficult in Bulgaria and Romania. And no country is free of corruption. We've now had enough investigations by Transparency International to know that. Um, the rule of law and a constitution which separates the judiciary from the executive must be the guiding principles. And here I must mention Ukraine because Europe is not intervening but getting pretty close to it. 
in Ukraine, and I've got doubts about that. Uh, Ukraine is currently causing a lot of anxiety um, and a diplomatic flurry. They're all flying in all directions to set settle it, no wonder. It's, it's, but it's 2014, not 1854. We don't have a gunboat anymore. Uh, well, we don't have a gunboat anyway now. Um, <laughs> it's, um, but it's a serious crisis if the president of Russia is flexing his muscles on behalf of a minority in Ukraine. At the same time, the EU and NATO, in my view, should show more restraint because Ukraine is by definition on two sides of a line. I believe Kerry and, and Craig should go to Moscow as well as to Kiev. We've got too many leaders just pouring into Kiev, but we, mu we must maintain the proper balance diplomatically. We've got to work with Russia on many issues such as Syria and Iran. And uh, we, we, we should make every effort to preserve that relationship. And we should attend the, the G8. I don't believe in suddenly calling the G8 the, the G7. Um, and we, I think we made a mistake not to go to Sochi in, in some cases for the first time. So to, to, to give it up second time is, is very serious. Sanctions, a degree of sanctions, obviously. We've got to do something to apply pressure. But we've got to be careful thinking about the long term. Now, I know Cyprus and Spain and others are quite reasonably concerned about the breakup of their own countries. Now, this is also uh, because of Kosovo. And I have, my wife and I have a personal interest in Kosovo because um, our daughter met a journalist in Afghanistan. And we now have a Kosovo son-in-law and two grandchildren. Uh, so you can imagine I am committed to an independent Kosovo and possibly to a new member of the European Union, <laughs> although this is some way down the line. But this is why uh, Spain is concerned, because of their own situation. Um, and Catalonia is another proud nation within a nation. Well, it, it doesn't have any real claim to independence, in, in my view, from what I've heard. And Scotland seems to relate to all separatist claims, but I don't think it does. After all, Kosovo was the object of genocide. Scotland was not. I don't like discussing Scotland. I think it's a waste of time. It's part of the United Kingdom. Um, I don't believe it'll, it'll uh, separate. I think we will have a sizable majority in favor of the Union. It's welded to England, and the UK is a strong ally, so why should we change it? My, my mother was descended from a Scottish grandparent and an Irish grandparent, and they undoubtedly gave her a broader view of the world. That's my view. And I had a grandmother from Chicago. I got a daughter-in-law from Chicago. And the fourth Earl's grandmother was a Jacobite while he was fighting for the Hanoverians. So what? We're all de descended from somewhere else. And all it means, or should mean, is that we've gained a, a wider world outlook, or we're welt anschung, as the Germans say. We should be all the richer for our antecedents. So I try and have an international perspective, although I reflect a traditional, undeniably traditional English background. Before entering Parliament, I spent most of my life working with NGOs in developing countries. I was on the staff of Christian Aid and Save the Children, and I worked closely with Care International, which is here as well, and Anti-Slavery anti International. I'm resolutely in favor of NGOs in international affairs, but while their role and influence is limited, their motivation and outreach is strong, and I believe they can have a, a lasting effect on policy especially in developing countries, and I believe that they are able to reach and empower the most deprived people on earth, and I've seen many examples of this, for example, in Andhra Pradesh in India, 
and Orissa have been impressed by the potential of so many small projects run by local professionals focusing on the poorest sections of society, such as the migrants, the outcast, and landless laborers. Young mothers receiving health care and nutrition are being, uh, becoming the agents of change in their villages, helped to start small businesses, for example, that brings wealth into the, into the community. So it, it's seeing these, the poorest people being given opportunities to support their families is, is a very exciting experience. I'm a long-standing stand, friend of Nepal. I visited several times. My, one of my visits last year was, was with WaterAid, which I'm sure you know is a world war, worldwide organization with enormous influence concerning the so-called WASH initiative, water and sanitation. And a group of parliamentarians from Asia were being given first-hand experience in the Kathmandu Valley. And we um, arrived in wonderful places called defecation-free zones. I don't know if you've ever been there, but they are wonderful. You get a wonderful chance to have a drink and look down the valley. Uh, it's the cleanest place you'll ever find. And I noticed that women and women's groups were always prominent. And I noticed often women who provide the organization and financial backup for communities in these situations. Just a few facts. The seven, 768 million don't have any access to safe water, which is one in ten of the population of the world. Um, and water aid reaches about 1.6 million out of 768 uh, and 1.9 with sanitation. So there's a long way to go but I was pleased to see that this has a high priority among the post-2015 UN targets. And this experience has been useful to me as a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the House of Lords. This is, this is a subcommittee of the European Union Committee. It's been examining the EU's development policy and using the example of water and sanitation. And most, uh, half of the projects were examined by the European Court, Court of Auditors a couple of years ago, and they were found to be ineffective partly because of the lack of sustainability, whether they would go on after the, the grant had been used up, but also because of the EU's bureaucratic processes. They weren't involving the communities sufficiently in the decision making, and they uh, sometimes didn't answer the telephone. So we accused the European Union of wasting money, and we recommended more engagement, closer cooperation with, with organizations, um, charity, charities and NGOs, and a greater access to funding for the smaller scale projects. At the same time, we acknowledge that the other half of the projects were going well. And as a member of the Select Committee, I've also played a small part in the scrutiny of legislation, and this is where I come to the House of Lords in a moment. We do it quite differently from the House of Commons, which has a single committee covering all aspects. We have six subcommittees dealing with different subjects. And for example, I'm on the one which covers foreign affairs, development and trade. And we're currently, as I've mentioned, looking at the new trade treaty. I was surprised to discover that the EU has embarked on defense. This is something I simply wasn't aware of. It's a subject which should belong to NATO, but the European Union has an interest in defense in circum certain circumstances which often relate to international development. And they have acronyms like Common Foreign Policy, CFSP and ESDP, which are always, fob always fobbing everyone off. I'm still learning the acronyms. But there are some significant projects, and one of them is called ULEX in Kosovo, which is a rule of law project in employing literally hundreds of police and 
lawyers and others in Kosovo. And another example is the Atalanta anti-piracy program off the coast of Somalia. Uh, this has a successful record in containing piracy. And another subject is um, an important but sometimes frustrating program to train women police in Afghanistan, well, in, to train Afghan police, but including police women. And this again is to reinforce the rule of law. So those are just some examples of the EU at work, and we, we have to scrutinize. I don't know whether I've got, yes, I've got in a minute, I'll tell you a little more about the numbers of things we have to do, but I've got to watch the clock. The House of Lords was nearly abolished in its present form in 1999 by Tony Blair's new government on the grounds that we lacked a democratic mandate. Now this is familiar to you in Australia. But Blair and Brown and co missed the vital point, which is that the House of Commons is the elected chamber and the Lords is a revising chamber. So they don't have to be elected. This is because our members, although semi-retired, have had much more life experience and have generally more expertise than MPs. Some of the MPs are still in short trousers, whereas our youngsters are pushing 45 and our average age is 68 or 9, which seems to be going up, by the way. Um, and we often have to make up ground on legislation which they have ignored. <coughs> you know, they just haven't got to it. They're partly because they're talking too much. And by the way, some of them join us later in life and they go on talking <laughs> when they're in the House of Lords, sometimes all night. Um, so as a result of what I call this political myopia, in a fit of peak, Blair and Brown decided to create more peers. Something funny about that. Um, it was partly to get rid of their more truculent MPs, but they started a habit which is still with us 15 years later, and is carried out by Messrs Cameron and Clegg today, the very people who tried to abolish us two years ago again. But this time they got a short shrift from the Tory MPs themselves. So this, this expansion has meant we have a House of Lords of 800 members. I mean, the, the other problem is that they're meant to be working. They're not, it's not just coming in casually. They've all got to come in. So there's no room to sit down. I mean, when I first joined in 1995, we had about 1,000 hereditary peers, but they didn't come in, um, or very rarely. So we elected only 92 out of a house of about then about 500. 26 of these are independents, of which I am one, and the, all the independents amount to nearly 200, which is about the size of the Labour Party and the Conservative Party as well. The hereditary principle, as I said, was now in, is now abolished, and in the present climate it's hard to say whether we're being preserved or not. But it's not quite as bad as it sounds, because we, uh, our average daily attendance is only about 475, and um, they tend to stay for the voting, and then the ones who are not involved in debates just go home after 6 or 7 o'clock. We have about 200 each of those groups that I've mentioned. Then we have about 90 liberals and 26 bishops. And we make 800 altogether. Some question the number of bishops. But because they're active in their diocese, we rarely have more than two or three at a time. And there are peers of Catholic, Jewish, Hindu, Sikh, Muslim, and other faiths, and quite a few of none. And what do we do? In the 2010-12 session, we asked 18,000 questions, apparently. Seems rather a lot, doesn't it? And we held 270 debates. 
We had 80 bills in front of us, of which 49 passed, and the rest either failed or were delayed. We considered about 10,000 amendments. Now this is worked out an average of 125 amendments per bill, of which, often by means of a vote, about two and a half thousand were successful. So that's, that's one in four. And then, of course, we have to review secondary legislation, which, like EU legislation, we think we, we consider in committees by means of a process called the SIFT, because we can't look at every single clause. We have a, a general SIFT, and then we look at the more important clauses uh, indi individually. And sometimes this is for wider consideration in the Grand Committee or, or in the whole House. Well, as you can imagine, it's not all fun. <laughs> and some of us get tired. There's some old gentlemen and ladies are occasionally found curled up in armchairs in the library as a result. Or other retreats exhausted from their labor or waiting to do battle again. But it is a f tremendous privilege to have been born into this remarkable institution called the House of Lords and the hereditary peerage. At this moment in time, and also it's a privilege to have been selected by my peers to work alongside so many distinguished men and women in public life. There are one or two active peers now in their 90s. And this means that I still have a whole career ahead of me. <laughs> Thank you very much. As the president of this organization, I've been known to come to meetings in shorts. Um, but leaving that aside, can I just, before I open it up to the floor, ask you a question. Um, three European countries, Serbia, Turkey, and now Ukraine, all want to join the European Union. Can you update us on what the status is? Um, are there, is there any hope of any of those three joining? Or are they going to be outlawed for good? Well, um, thank you, Colin. The, the, one, the one that I know about is um, Serbia, because Kosovo and Serbia have had to go in tandem. And the, the European External Action Service has been very active in keeping those two countries in, in, in line together. And it's a quite a remarkable thing that Serbia, having persecuted most of its neighbors is now actually playing ball and that's because they have a, a prime minister who gets on with his counterpart prime minister and when they are no longer elected I think there may be a problem but Serbia is definitely coming along nicely now um, who are the other two sir? Ukraine and Turkey well, Tur Turkey's, poor Turkey has been trying for longer than any other state to join the European Union and uh, as far as I can see, um, it's always going to be told, just wait a little longer. And in fact, more recently, Turkey has started to say, well, actually, do we need the European Union? We're doing quite nicely. We've got a economic growth in Turkey. I think now they're going through a period of trouble, but um, I'm sure it's a strong enough state not to really mind if it doesn't join. But it's it's definitely got an associated status. And the Ukraine, of course, has no real connection. It comes under the neighborhood policy. And that's where, as I said earlier, I think the EU, if it intervenes too politically, will get into a lot of trouble with Russia. Would you just say your name and association, please? Thank, Thank you. you for, um Steve Sloan, member of the Institute. Uh, thank you for your um, overview, uh, most interesting. Um, I want to narrow the focus down to one particular <coughs> element of the British EU um, uh, connection. Um, at the end of the Second World War, one of the most interesting books was published by an Australian, um, Chester Wilmot, The Struggle for Europe. 
and on the fly leaf it had a very small statement that said, in 1939 Britain went to war to maintain the balance of power in Europe. Thanks to the intervention of the Americans, she lost it to the Russians. Um, now I'm not interested in this stage in the Americans and the Russians, I'm interested in the point of the British having a role as the balance of power in Europe, and you can almost go back to 1066, um, Eleanor of Navarre marrying Henry II and all the way through, Britain has had an interesting role uh, fighting both for and against many of the European countries. Um, and yet in this discussion about Britain's role in uh, the European Union, it, I don't hear or see anybody discussing the fact that Britain has in fact had a serious role over a very long period of time as a balancing power. Well, I, I don't know if it's a question or a statement because I, I think everybody ought to make a statement, by the way, and not expect to have an answer. I, I always think that's a good principle. But the, the most, most of your statement I completely understand. And the question is really, should we be more recognized as a world power rather than whether we are a world power? And the famous phrase still rings in one's ears that we're punching above our weight. And I think that is still holds true because we do still have the Security Council veto and we've got to keep faith with France if it's a case of European policy. And you, you remember there have been some successful and some less successful ventures. But I think, you know, we could say that we had a, a good start in Libya as long as everybody's forgotten what happened after that. Um, it was not a, ultimately very satisfactory, but we are training together, we are exchanging much more on defence, and of course we're both ne members of NATO, so as long as Chancellor Merkel is happy with her situation, which is financial muscle largely, then we will, we will go on holding the balance with France, and so we, we, must, we must remain like that, I think. It's not exactly an answer. But. Thank you, John. Uh, very interesting talk. I, I must say I was, um, Richard Bernowski, I must say I was uh, very interested to hear your self-assurance at the fact that you're a hereditary peer and you don't have to owe anything to your, no doubt, strong accomplishments. You are what you are. And that's something we do not have in Australia. But we do have a Senate. We do have a Senate uh, Foreign Affairs and Defence Committee. They're all elected. No one in Australia is a peer by hereditary uh, merit. They are very active in pursuing um, the having a checks and balance on what the, what the, 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 the lower house does in terms of uh, defence and foreign policy decisions. My question to you is this. We were interested, many of us, in the fact that Britain did not support the United States in going in hard or even at all against the rebel, against the Syrian government. And probably that prevented a terrible bloody stoush in that country. Your own committee in the, in the um, the House of Lords. Did it have a role to play in this? And what was your personal view about it? Well, I, I have to admit straight away, uh, I was being worried about Richard's question, which direction it was going to come from this evening. Um, I, I'm, I'm not altogether at, at ease at the, well, the one that he chose, because I think, um, first of all, our committee is certainly not executive in any sense at all. It deals with, with research and looking at a problem in a wider field. So we wouldn't give any advice directly on foreign policy, except through correspondence. We do have a bit of limited role in getting the minister to come and talk to us. And if it happens to be that moment when he's making a decision on Syria, then we would, we would say what we felt. And um, certainly we would have discouraged intervention. And um, I don't know how many in this room would have after all the experience we've had, have made a decision to go into Syria. And I don't think we would have prevented what's actually happening 
it might have made it much worse. So, um, you know, going back to the Senate, I know you've, you've had a, a situation of confrontation. And that is the, precisely the reason that most of us are against the principle of election of an upper house. Um, because if you do have a confrontation, and America is another example, you have a stalemate in Congress quite often because there are two legitimately elected houses. So we are, we are you know, telling people what they know, really. Thank you. Um, Alex Erskine, currently a non-member, again a non-member, I think you um, Actually, you've now been in Australia um, for two whole days, so it's high time to ask you an Australian question, um, which, um, which isn't sort of how do you like it, um, but much more, um, can you think of a single reason why Australia ought not become a republic? <laughs> um, I don't think Australia wants to become a republic, though. So, are we are we really going back into this whole issue again? Yes. Uh, we are. Yes. Okay. We are. Yes. How many Republicans are we in the society? Yes. Uh, sort of a strong minority, shall we say? <laughs> like the Russians in Ukraine, something like in Crimea. <laughs> A strong minority. I think. I think the debate will always go on. Um, I don't know whether the Queen and her family have done any harm to Australia. I think they've actually enhanced society in Australia. I don't personally think they should have any role in your country beyond, you know, the the principle of the crown, which is. It counts for something. I agree it's mostly sentimental. But we don't want to throw away anything that counts for something. Um, it's daunting that we now have a Prince George now. Because after all, that means for poor Republicans, they've got to wait another three generations. But th there are things going on. I mean, we do have minor reforms. We mustn't forget there's a new... And I don't know what Australia is doing about this, but we are still waiting to hear from Australia, whether you're going to sign this legislation enabling a woman to succeed to the monarchy um, if she's the oldest in the family, which is a significant change. <laughs> and then there's the question of whether she could be a Roman Catholic. And I think all the territories in the, uh, in, in the crown, under the crown have, have signed on to this, but Australia is hesitating, so maybe you'll, you'll have the answer to that. I don't know. I think that's, that's, that's a good question. I think, um, I think there's some concern that the Queen has said that she supports the English cricket team. Really? That's the Queen of England, not the Queen of Australia. <laughs> I mustn't talk about cricket. It's too painful. I'm going to watch your great captain getting towards his 200. Or has he? No, he's lost that chance, hasn't he? Declared That's going to be later in the evening. Oh, it's declared. All right. Okay. <laughs> no, he's done a job. Very good job. I must keep saying that. Hello, my name is Peter Bruce, and I'm a member here. And thank you very much for your address tonight. Um, I think you mentioned that you joined the House of Lords in 1995, um, maybe two decades. And I'm just wondering if you could reflect on those two decades. And if you think of the, the typical family, what's the difference those decades have brought as far as education, health, employment, um, just day-to-day -day well-being of life, the security? Thank you. Well, we are still arguing with um, welfare benefits because there's no doubt that T Tony Blair brought in a new administration which was a great, a great relief for the majority of the country. I mean, that's why he was elected. There was tremendous enthusiasm. Um, it's just that we've overreached 
and it, it's happening, I think, in all the developed countries that we're having to pull back from those benefits. And it's, it's actually quite painful in some cases where you have disabled groups who are being denied the rule of law. They're not getting legal aid to argue their case. And this is seriously affecting organizations like the Citizens Advice Bureau, which probably you have here, do you? Which is essential to some families who cannot survive on small amounts of money. And they haven't got a, bread, a breadwinner, and they may have a particular disability or something that the government would never discover what, what really was wrong. And so the um, safety net is going. There is no doubt about it. And I, I've been especially concerned about legal aid, although I work mainly on international affairs, where we get the rights of uh, asylum seekers and refugees. There are plenty of areas there where we are maltreating people who are here in our country, whether we have invited them or not, they are being maltreated because they're put in a category beyond help. And, and, and the present government is still trying to introduce legislation which denies as, asylum seekers parts of the health system. And I mean, if you have a, you know, I can't, I, st I won't go into detail, but there are situations which are very painful and uh, we're not treating them as human beings. But on the, in the general population, uh, we've got increasing lobbies against the new, um, legislation. So we may see a change of government as a result in two years' time, or one year's time. I've got time for one last question, and Somber you have your hand up first. Well, I've actually got a, a Chris Hainer, I remember. Um, perhaps two questions. Do I remember a lot of sandwich figures prominently in the diaries of Samuel Pepys? And secondly, um, do you see NATO as remaining, if you like, the defence arm of the European Union? And if so, do you see it opening up to membership from other democracies around the world, since it's taken on a more global role? How long have we got, Colin? <laughs> mm. I warm to anyone who asks me about Samuel Pepys, because he was a relative of the first Earl of Sandwich. And uh, they, they lived in the same town. It just happened to be that Mr. Oliver Cromwell was living next door, so they had to go and become Re Republicans, and they were fighting against the monarchy, let us say. So Edward Montagu, the, who became the first Earl of Sandwich later on, was actually a very, um, uh, what shall I say, he was a um, scholarly person, and he left us a journal which is still in the family because when he was the admiral uh, and when he was the ambassador in Spain he, he kept wonderful records in his own handwriting and obviously understood the societies he was living in. So I feel he was well qualified to receive the title of the Earl of Sandwich and Samuel Pepys certainly describes this in great detail so thank you for mentioning that. I'm the president of the Samuel Pepys Club, too. <laughs> we have regular meetings, rather like you. Um, and a dinner. I hope you have a good dinner once a year. Um, I don't see any alternative to NATO. Um, there, there has been, as I mentioned earlier, a sort of a little bit of insidious defense making by the European Union. But it only becomes insidious if it, if it embarks on NATO's territory. And, and you get a country like Ukraine, which has you know, is, is got a relationship with NATO now. There will be rules, and I'm not clear, I'm, I'm sure somebody here will know, there are, there are rules of whether you engage uh, on behalf of an associated nation or not. But um, I think that that is the way forward. I can't see any alternative. Thank you very much. Um, before I ask um, 
someone to come up and uh, vote, propose a vote of thanks. In fact, it will be Bob Howard. I just want to tell you about next week's event, which will be about the Middle East, and which we're bringing back Anthony Billingsley. Uh, those who are regulars here will know that Anthony Billingsley is one of the best speakers on the Middle East in Australia today. It's on television, on radio a lot, but apart from that, he travels to the area, he understands what's going on, and he's coming here next week. So I'm sure most of you will want to come and listen to that. And so if uh, Dr. Howard would come up and propose a vote of thanks, he can close the evening. Thank you very much. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Colin. Uh, look, I think we do owe a, uh, a very big vote of thanks to the Earl of Sandwich for uh, giving us his uh, time and his observations. Some of the issues he spoke about are issues which rarely get a mention in this forum, uh, for, I suppose, very understandable reasons. Uh, we've learned a little more about um, the House of Lords, which is uh, new to Australian ears to some extent. We don't really have a comparable institution, although people have made uh, remarks about the upper house of uh, the New South Wales Parliament as being one of the most um, uh, comfortable clubs in the whole of Australia. But seriously, we have nothing comparable to the House of Lords. And it was interesting to hear uh, your observations, particularly with regards to the differences in the committee systems between the House of Lords and the House of Commons. I also got the impression that was probably, and this is to pick up on something that Colin said earlier, I got the impression that there was possibly a fair bit of debate in the House of Lords about uh, foreign policy. Uh, if that is the case, it does compare, um, or Australia doesn't compare particularly well, because it's one of the characteristics of the Australian parliamentary uh, practice and, and system, that there are in fact very, very few debates about foreign policy uh, in the Australian Parliament, either in the Senate or in the House of Representatives. And this of course is what uh, Colin mentioned earlier. It's also interesting to hear uh, your observations about um, the upcoming referendum in the United Kingdom uh, about membership um, of the European Union. It's a tremendously important issue and it was uh, gratifying to hear your observations about some of the important uh, issues in that debate. Immigration, for instance, and uh, concerns about the balance between uh, Europe and the national parliaments. And that brings me, of course, to what I, I really want to comment on in thanking you, and that is the EU itself. I've been teaching international relations for many, many years, and I've often thought it's a pretty grim sort of narrative. Uh, and then along came the EU. And instead of Europe being a place of endless conflict, it became, after 1945, the most peaceful part of the world. So something happened, and it's reasonable to argue that the thing that happened was the European uh, Union. And, uh, and so the concerns that have emerged in recent years are to people such as myself, I suppose, who view the EU in that rather positive light, um, rather uh, depressing. But we've heard tonight a fairly spirited defence of, of the EU. Uh, there was a concession, as I said earlier, to the problems about the relationship between uh, Brussels and the national parliament. But generally speaking, uh, you provided us with a number of good examples of why the EU is an institution uh, worth uh, preserving. And so I imagine most Australians are going to watch very, very closely uh, the outcome of the referendum in, um, in Britain, but as well as that, what is actually 
happening in Europe itself. For despite what hopes and aspirations you might have about the European Union, there are obviously real political and economic issues. And whether or not those can be uh, surmounted remains to be seen. So let me thank you on behalf of the Institute very much for coming along. Uh, we greatly appreciated uh, your remarks and we hope you and your wife enjoy the rest of your time in Australia. Well, thank you very much. Before everybody leaves, I just want to mention a small gift I'm going to hand over to Colin, uh, a book about the House of Lords, and I, I can't read this now without my glasses, a postcard of the Speaker's Chair in the House of Commons. Well, I'm sure some of you will know this is very important symbolically because the Speaker's Chair was made of black bean from North Queensland given by Australia to replace the old chair destroyed by fire in an air raid on the 10th of May 1941. So.